It's my pleasure to welcome Fareed Tare of the Institute of Mathematical Sciences and Computing, which I translated into English from Portuguese because I wouldn't dream of trying to pronounce the Portuguese, uh, who will speak to us today on <coughs> umbilic points. Thank you, David. It's a great pleasure to be here to visit the center at last. You know. So it's a nice place. And uh, so what I'm going to talk is about some problem <coughs> on umbilic points. So I'll start with some simple elementary notions of differential geometry, then I will pose the, the problem. So first, <coughs> I'll be talking about surfaces in, in the Euclidean space, R3. <coughs> so what's the Euclidean space here? So basically, just the vector space R3, and we have the scalar product. So if I have two vectors here, u1, u2, u3, basic, let's keep it basic to start with. <coughs> uh, for some reasons, I need this to be. So I have the scalar product, which is everybody knows, <coughs> u3, v3. Because we have scalar product, we can measure things, angles, we can measure lengths of vectors, and this will give us a metric, which is the Euclidean metric in R3. Yeah, <clears throat> so what is a smooth surface? Uh, maybe I should write this down here so I have more space. <clears throat> so what's a smooth surface um, in R3? It's just some some set in subset in R3, which I will take that it's so surface, smooth surface, will be parameterized <coughs> by some map, smooth map, phi, smooth map, u open subset in R2, and phi smooth. C infinity map. And of course, I'm going to assume here that if here is u, now I'm changing my notations here. It's not a vector. <laughs> if u is in u, then I will assume that phi u, phi v are linearly independent. So you have well-defined tangent space and also assume that this is a homeomorphism. But anyway, this is what my oh, surface. So you are assuming it's a I'm assuming, yeah, yeah. I'm not there. Uh, right. So this is a surface, a surface for me in R3. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so because I have locally for the moment, we can define what everybody knows here, which is the Gauss map. What's the Gauss map? <coughs> it's just, again, locally at each point here, because I have these are linearly independent, I have a tangent, a well-defined tangent plane. So what I do, I take one normal vector. I choose one unit normal vector, because there are two. <laughs> so, so here, the Gauss map will be just in this case, u to s2. For our case, we take this, this the vector product divide by the norm. <clears throat> because they are linearly independent, I can divide the norm is never zero, so I can do that. <clears throat> OK, this is the gas map. If my surface is orientable, then I can define n globally. OK. So what do we have from this? We get the shape operator. <coughs> so the shape operator, now I can go back here. I have my Gauss map with the unit sphere. At each point here, what I do, I just take this vector, translate it here. I have my M of P. What's the shape of operator? I'm just differentiating at each point. I differentiate this Gauss map. So it will take, this is a linear map. It starts from the tangent plane to the surface. And it should go to the tangent plane to the sphere at this point. But this tangent plane and this one can be identified because they have the same normal. So this ends up in a it's a linear map from the tangent plane to the tangent plane. It's an operator. And this is a self. I'll put a minus here because I need 
just for uh, not to have minus later on. This is called the shape operator, and it's self-adjoint. <coughs> what does it mean, self-adjoint? So if I use the scalar product, I apply to vector u, scalar vector v. This is the same as vector v <coughs> applied vector u. Okay, this is a self-joint operator. Now, because I have a surface, the surface is in uh, the sur my surface is in R three, so the scalar product in R three, I can the, the surface inherits the scalar product in R three on the tangent plane. So I have metric here on the surface, because uh, this metric will be Riemannian, and I have self joint operator on the Riemannian surface, you know, I have to conclude that this self-adjoint operator, this DNP, has always real eigenvalues, and it has always eigenvectors also. Because of this, because the metric, <coughs> metric is Riemannian, metric on M, the induced metric, because the induced metric is Riemannian, then we have DNP has always two eigenvectors, has always, has always two eigenvalues, two real eigenvalues, eigenvalues that are denoted by kappa 1, kappa 2, and are called principal curvatures. Okay, and it has two the associated eigenvectors, <coughs> eigenvectors E1 and E2 are orthogonal if the eigen if the eigen values of the principal curvatures are not equal, are not equal. If they are equal, then, then basically the shape operator will be a multiple of the identity and every, every vector is an eigenvector, okay? So this is, and E1 and E2 are called, uh, called the principal, principal directions. <clears throat> okay. So what's a non-bilic point? A non-bilic point is a point where the principal curvatures are equal. So this is the first definition of <coughs> a non-bilic point. So non-bilic point. Is a point on M where K1, K2. Equivalently, where the shape operator is a multiple of the identity. Is a multiple of the identity. Okay? <coughs> this is one definition of non bilic points. So I'm giving you another way to define umbilic points. <coughs> so yeah. It's called an umbilic point on M. Yeah. So is it independent of phi? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's independent, yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. It's independent <laughs> of the parametrization. So another way to <coughs> define umbilic points, which I will need later, because the second part is I'm going to change the metric and look at surfaces in Minkowski space. And there are points where I wouldn't have this shape operator. So I would not be able to define umbilic points in this way. So then I will use this second method. Okay, another way to define the umbilic points is via the lines, the principal lines of curvature. But before that, I need some notation. What is the first fundamental form? It's just 
the first fundamental form. You all know what is this. <coughs> so it's, a, it's just the metric. If I take a vector here, this is just the length. The, it's just basically the, uh, the induced. Uh, it's the restriction of the scalar product in R3 to the tangent plane. Okay, But if I take now any vector in the tangent plane, can be written as, as a linear combination of the generators phi u and phi v. Yeah? Because if, if I have my surface, this is a tangent plane. This is generated by phi u, phi v at that point. So this is the basic of the tangent plane. I can write like this. Then I can, <coughs> it will be, oopa. A phi u, you have done all this, but I'll write it. Just, it's good sometimes to remember. First elementary differential geometry course. But now if I write this, this I can write it as a squared e plus 2abf plus b squared g, <clears throat> where what is e is just phi u phi v is the length of this vector f phi u, phi v, and g is equal phi v, phi v. Okay, this is the first fundamental form or the metric on, on M, of course, written in this chart, okay, in this parameterization. Okay, the second fundamental form is just basically the shape operator. And we have the second, this is called the first fundamental form. Our metric. Do you have differential geometry course here? Some years. It exists, <laughs> it exists in the catalog. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so <laughs> now it's second fundamental form, same thing. It's a quadratic form. Form, so I have so the second. In a way, it's, it's sad because uh, even when we do differential geometry uh, and uh, for the graduate students, uh, we do the completely general abstract and forget kind of exactly. the beginnings of the. Differential geometry of surfaces, like yeah. the carbon, which yeah. is an excellent yeah. first place to see differential exactly. geometry. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, yeah, you start with uh, manifolds and green money. Oh, no, you start with turrets and atlases. Oh, God. <laughs> that yeah. That's something you can't picture. It's that's a how I learned. In terms of yeah, yeah. functions. That's how I learned. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the Bourbaki style. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So this is <coughs> second fundamental form. And you can use the same trick, and you can write it as a square L plus 2AB M plus B square N, where L is equal to N phi U U second M equal to N phi U V and N is M phi V V. Okay. The reason here is what what is this? This is basically and you if if this is uh, if you yeah I'll, I better just leave it here because <laughs> yeah so you get similar so you, you use the fact that n u uh, n times phi u equal to zero, because this is orthogonal, and you differentiate n u phi u plus n phi u u equal to zero. So n u phi u minus n u phi u is exactly n phi u u. So what is a line of curvature? <coughs> what is a line of curvature? This is a curve in M or on M, on M such that so I have a curve on M. It's such that at each point, it is one, its tangent is a principal direction. Such that at each point, such that 
its tangent at each point is a principal direction. Okay? So this is a line of curvature. So because if I am away from umbilic points, umbilic points, <coughs> so if I take a point which is not umbilic, not umbilic, so I take a point not umbilic, I have two principal directions which are orthogonal. In fact, nearby, I have nearby directions as well. So if I integrate it, I get two solutions. So I get two curves which pass through every non-umbilic point, and they are orthogonal. So there are two principal curve, two principal cur uh, two lines of principal curvature at each non-umbilic point. Okay, and their equations, the equations, the, the differential equation of the line of curvature is, is easy to remember. It's just you put the coefficients of the first fundamental form and the coefficients of the second fundamental form, and you calculate this, and you get a differential equation. It's a quadratic differential equation. So this is, what's that? It's dv squared, so f and minus mg. I don't know how to calculate this game. <laughs> DF, so EN minus LG DU DV, mice plus EM, please check, <laughs> LF DU squared. Oh, no, you got the minus up there. Yeah, yeah. Ah, aha. Uh -huh. I'm craving some of the calculations. Yeah. So, this is yeah. my equation, okay? So I, th I can solve it away from umbilic points. I can factorize this into two ordinary differential equations, integrate them, I get two lines. When I cannot factorize it, I cannot factorize it exactly at points, at umbilic points, and this point is exactly where, the, where these are zero. So at umbilic points, umbilic points, if and only if the coefficients are zero, And minus Fg to zero, yeah, minus, yeah, Lf equal to zero. In fact, under some conditions, in, in, it's enough to have two of them is zero, imply the third one. Can you draw one for us? Yeah, uh, second now. Oh, jeez. Draw a sphere. Everything's going to go. No, no, no. <laughs> hey, no, no, no. Sorry, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'll come, I'll come in there. So, uh, so what I'm going to draw to you the generic lines of curvature. So away from umbilic points, I know I have this net. At umbilic, at umbilic points, there are some figures drawn by Darbu, but the proof was given by Sotomayor Gutierrez and Bruce and Feidel. There are three generic cases. Normally here, I should, because I have ch chalk, I can, I can I color. I can use, uh, so there are two. One is like this, and the other is like this. <laughs> and the next one, ah, it's more complicated, I think. Let me just draw it like this, okay. Okay. And these are the lines of curvature at generic, <coughs> the generic cases. This is called the lemon by Porteus, star, mon star. <coughs> okay, so these are the lines. As uh, Terry said, every, on the sphere, every point is on belly. But there is on. On an ellipsoid, we'll go to an ellipsoid, and you will see we're getting there. <coughs> so, just here. Change colors there. That was to indicate the different curvatures. Exactly, different curvatures. Or di there are two. There are two here. 
you can choose one of the, give color to one, to both of them. You know. And then as the, in the start of the curvature is changing, it goes through the uh, bowing point. The, the, they're equal at the points, and then, That's yeah. Right. Exactly, yeah. Okay. And, uh, right, since you guys work on determinantal varieties, so I will tell you something about that here. So when I, something I worked with uh, Bill Bruce on this, uh, th these equations, it's, so lines of curvatures equation <coughs> of lines of curvature, I can write, I write them in general like this. <coughs> the two just to make life easier. Which is we call binary differential equation. <coughs> okay. So this is binary equation, and the key feature of this equation is the discriminant, which is b, b squared minus ac. I put the two there so that b squared minus ac. So what's happening? Away from discriminant, you can either have, away from discriminant, you can have two solutions or nothing. This is delta equal to zero. And on the discriminant, you have a unique solution. These two come together. Okay. So key feature really of binary differential equation is the discriminant. And it happens that for the equation of the lines of curvature, the discriminant is an isolated point. In fact, for this, it has a more singularity. For the lines of curvature, for the lines of principal curvature, delta has an A1 plus singularity. <coughs> okay? So it's an isolated point. For lines of curvature, when you deform the, your surface, the umbilic, this is stable. So this, you, de, you don't deform this. But if you look at them inside the set of these equations, when you deform it, this will deform. So this point will open up. So the theory you would think, because I have more singularity, it will open up to a circle, a point, and disappears. Yeah? But this is not the case. The way the discriminants at an A1 plus <coughs> so bifurcation <coughs> of delta at an A1 plus are cone sections. It means I have a point <coughs> close up. Okay, so you don't get the usual more singularity, the usual more singular x squared plus y squared plus t equal to zero. You get a circle if t is positive, a point if t equals zero, and an empty set. Here you get, <coughs> yeah. So this really started the. Uh, investigation of the way how to look at this. The way you look at this deformation, the best way, best way, best way to study deformation, deformation is to consider the discriminant as the determinant of this matrix. <coughs> so delta equals zero, you have a family of matrices family of symmetric matrices. And the determinant of this is the discriminant. <coughs> okay? So for example, then you have the action of the right group here, and you multiply by uh, 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 parameterized uh, surface in the general linear group and multiply by its transverse because you want to preserve symmetry. So in this case, for example, if you have x, y, y, I put mine there, you get x plus t. This is a versal deformation and you get the cone sections. <coughs> this is what the initial work on the families of symmetric matrices motivation and also we did for general matrices. 
Anyway, back to umbilic points. So I have the surface. In general, there are some points that are umbilic. For if I take a closed surface, which is convex, like a sphere, I have millions of them. Every point is umbilic, so I have at least two. And there is this conjecture. <clears throat> so it's all elementary, but it can get complicated. So complicated that the problem is still open since 1924. Cara <laughs> Theodori <clears throat> conjecture. It tells us that if I have any smooth, <coughs> closed, and convex surface has at least two umbilic points. <coughs> it is hard to hear that's not known. Uh, here you go. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, I cannot list you the number of people who tried to prove it. and It's hard to believe. Did anybody suggest giving it to Milner as a homework problem? Um, <laughs> maybe. When he was in college. <laughs> maybe he tried. I don't know. Some others tried. So what it tells us, if I have a convex surface, if I have a convex surface and it's closed, smooth, then I have at least two. That I have one is easy, because if I take one direction field defined by the lines of curvature, and I use the sum of the indices, will give me the Euler characteristic, which is two, so I have to have at least one. So the question is to have two. So for a long time, what people tried and until now is to show that the index of the umbilic point is always less or equal to one. Then you will have at least two. But they proved in some cases, but not others, but it's still, the problem is still open, so I'm not going to solve it for you today. What I'm going to try uh, now is to see if I have a surface which is born. I will explain what's the meaning of a surface born, and to see how many umbilic points are there. And then I'll, I'll tell you why I'm trying to do this. So uh, this is the conjecture, and what I'm trying to see is open, still open to my, to my knowledge, it's still open. So what I'm going to try to see is how many umbilic points, how many umbilic points, how many umbilics are there? Are there? I don't know if they are there on a newly born surface. I'll tell you how what's a newly born surface. <clears throat> it's exactly the same idea as this. If you take this, this function here, at t equals 0, you have a point. t negative, you have a circle. So you have a birth of a circle that goes to a point, goes to nothing. So it's the same idea. Now I increase the dimension here. I'm in R3. I take a function that has a more singularity. So at, the, at, uh, at, at t equal to 0, I have a point. t positive, nothing. And then I have something which is born. <coughs> so so the simplest way. <coughs> To have a birth of surface, a birth of surfaces, or surface because they come in families, is via, uh, via the fi fibers. Is through fibers or via the fibers of a function. Let's say germ of function with more singularity. Singularity of index 
0 or 3 more singularity, which is R equivalent by changes of coordinates here to plus or minus x squared <coughs> plus x squared. Yeah? So if I take plus, then f minus 1 of 0 will be just 0. f minus 1, let's say epsilon, will be empty. f minus 1 epsilon here will be a closed surface. <coughs> here for epsilon, for example, negative, epsilon positive, or vice versa. The, uh, depend on the sign. So you have you have so this is how what I mean by birth of surfaces. <coughs> so if I have the more singularity, then I can write I want to talk about <laughs> I can always, can always make Euclidean changes of coordinates in R3 and write F, F, X, Y, F is equal x squared over lambda 1 squared <coughs> because I, I want to study the geometry of the surface so I cannot make any changes of God I cannot make any diffeomorphism because any closed surface convex is diffeomorphic to a sphere then I destroy everything the geometry so I'm only making rotations here and you can always write it this way I'm going to assume <coughs> always this. So if I have this is 0, then I have an ellipsoid. <coughs> if I take strictly, I have an ellipsoid. And if you go to the book of uh, Hilbert and Kohn-Wossen, Geometry and the Imagination, you get the, you see that there are four umbilic points. <coughs> so this is in book of Hilbert and Kohn-Wossen. For the ellipsoid, the ellipsoid. <coughs> okay. And now, what in the, in the recent reprint with Mazaru, who did postdoc with me in uh, in San Carlos, <coughs> what we showed is in fact this is true for any of this ca in this case actually. So you have the first theorem. <coughs> so if lambda lambda one is less than lambda two strictly less than lambda so the eigen vec the eigen values there or one of over the eigen values is is uh, are different of the square root of the Hessian, are different than, well, before I, may, I should say that f minus 1 of a, in this case, then f minus 1, f minus 1 of epsilon is a closed and convex surface. So we are in the, uh, the setting of the conjecture. Okay, so if lambda or lambda the three, so then f minus one, I could write it here, is convex. Convex has exactly four umbilic points. 
all lemon, all of type lemon. So, so they are like this, <laughs> lines of character, not the lemon you put there on no, the table. No, I was trying to remember which <laughs> I, one uh, looks like a lemon. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's exactly like <laughs> lemon. Isn't that obvious, eh? <laughs> and the second, <laughs> we relax a bit. <clears throat> the same thing, if lambda 1 is equal to lambda 3 is less than, or, or lambda 1 less than lambda 2, lambda 2 of this eigen, yeah, like it's the square root of the eigenvalues of one of the eigenvalues of the Hessian. If these are satisfy this, then f minus 1 of epsilon has 2, 4, 6, or 8 umbilicals. So at least in, this, in these two cases, when surfaces are born, the character of their conjecture is true. Are they also Here, I don't know. I don't know. I think when there are two, they are not. Uh, two, because lemon is the index is 1 over 4. So you need four of them to make the Euler characteristics. But so it's true in the case of 1 theorem 1, theorem 2. Now, if lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2 is equal to lambda 3, then the 2 jet of f is spherical, so you have almost like a sphere. Then there is a work of uh, a student of uh, in Porteus, Macartes. What he did is he deformed the two jet by cubic terms, and he looked at the umbilic points. And there are lots, 27, 18, depending on the cubic. So there are lots of them in the case of the, uh, the deformation. But we don't have the exact number. So I'll just give you an idea how the proof the proof is, is just some calculations. <coughs> Maybe I'll skip. Well, I'll just give you, all right. Well, just the idea of the proof, quickly, all right. Idea <coughs> of the proof. So basically, what you do, we know what umbilic points are. Umbilic points is where E, the coefficients of of the lines of curvature are zero. <coughs> and so umbilics is where f minus f f f f is equal to epsilon and u equal to zero w equal to 0, for example. It's this set. Why I'm not taking u and v? Because this u and v, I spent some, a month doing some calculation. I only get this 0. It's because they have lines of singularity. You can show that they have lines of singularity, these ones. So you, but you, you need to, because the umbilic points is where two of these, in, if you have two of these are equal, 0 implies the third one. But you have to be careful which one of the two are you choosing. So I'll choose u and w. So you, the idea, so f equal to epsilon is a sphere. Yeah, f implies it's not a sphere. It's a closed set. You know it's a closed set. So you want to understand what u equals 0 and w equals 0. This you can calculate <coughs> uh, in terms, can calculate, calculate in terms of of d f i over d x uh, a1 d x i2 y these ones no the, the, this is actually this is what uh, i i don't know because uh, what I tried, it didn't work. didn't work. It didn't work. I'll tell you why. Because u 
is so, so maybe let's just write. I spent, you know, and then I used something else. It is okay. It is okay. It, yeah, plus O4. <coughs> w is equal to some constant here. Z lambda 2 squared minus lambda 3 squared lambda y squared x squared plus lambda 3 squared minus lambda 1 squared over lambda 2 squared y squared. I'll bear with me just a second. <laughs> it's important that I write this. Z squared plus no, 4. Oh, that's what one would guess. Huh? Really? <laughs> well, the first thing you see here is this uh, uh, involves only the land eyes. They don't involve the higher jet. Uh, and the first, the, the first instinct using single eye theory, I show that the maps U, uh, comma W is finitely determined. So I can use polynomial representations. And I have the zero is, uh, is a curve. And then if I understand the curve, how the curve is, then I know how many points are. So the first thing is using singularity, but I couldn't really work out what it is. So what, uh, what's this set u equal to w is And the idea is simple now, is to use blowing up. You blow up the singularity and see what's happening. So if you use blowing up, <coughs> then it's easy. <laughs> blowing up. Yeah, yeah, blowing up x is equal to uw, y is equal to vw. This is just one, one chart of the blowing up. So you can see that you can factor out here term of w. You have uv, uv here times w. So on w equal to 0, on w equal to 0, so you, what do you have? You have uv equal to 0, and, and you have this. Equal to, here you have u squared, here you have v squared plus constant. Now you look at the signs, and you see, in fact, you have only solutions. Solutions. So what do you have? So this, let's see. It's c1 squared plus c2 squared v squared plus c3 squared, c3 equal to 0. So this is negative because lambda 2 is, is less. This is positive. This is positive. Yeah? This is negative. This is positive, this is positive. So if I put u equal to 0, I don't have a solution. So I need v equal to 0. When v equals 0, I have two, two points. So I have two points. Two points on, on v equal to 0. I have two solutions, u1 and u2. And you can show that here you have two surfaces intersecting transversely. So you have two curves. And then you blow down. You blow down, you have two curves. And you have your here, so you have four points. Okay. So here, what I have, I have, yeah, if I put v equal to zero, if I put u equal to zero, because of the signs, I don't have solution. I have this and this equal to zero, yeah? When v, now, so I have to have v equal to zero. When v equal to zero, I have here two solutions, u1 and u2. So then I'm going back to these surfaces. Surfi and because I have two points of intersection, I calculate that they, they intersect transversely. So the intersections are curves. And I blow down, and I found two curves with semi-transverse curves there. So because I have a convex set, then I have four intersection points. OK. Now, one lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2 is different from lambda 3. You do this analysis, and you see that the curves for the theorem 2, you see that the curves <coughs> for theorem 2, you get these types of curves. So u, u, u equal w equal to 0, you get either this, this, this type of singularities. So you get two. Two, uh, two, four, six, or eight cases. Okay, so 
Let me, because I want to get to the, uh, the <coughs> to the Minkowski case. But before I'm, I'm doing Minkowski case, because here is, is maybe, if there is somebody who wants to prove, this is maybe a way to prove the contraction. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> so you have a convex surface, yeah? I can deform it till I get the point. And make sure that when I get here, I have Morse. Here I have I have good deform through. through some I'll tell you how. So I'll tell you how that how I deform it. So when I deform it, so first is there deformation, 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 so that all, all surfaces are convex? I think that this is. I think this is true. Here is is a physical way to do this. I, th I think it's true. Is possible? Why? <coughs> think think in the case of uh, of a curve. If we take a closed curve, convex, suppose that it's the boundary of some uh, elastic membrane, membrane, yeah? And put, uh, put a, a, a heavy weight, a point, uh, heavy weight. So the membrane will deform, and it will give you something like the gravitational well. Gravitational, <laughs> gravitational well. I think when you take its sections, you get convex curves. So I believe, I, I talked to somebody, a physicist, and he explained something. By, this is just the initial thing I haven't been working on. I think it's possible to do it. You can deform. Things. And the next, of course, when you deform, you want the geometry. There should be some umbilic points that are essential. That you, you might have some birth of umbilic that disappears, but some of them are essential. That will not disappear. And then I think you get, you get the proof. <laughs> At the end of the dinner, someone will, <laughs> one of you will prove it. Uh, the, 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 OK, all right. <laughs> not in the World, world, world Center? No. No? Ah, no. OK. I didn't yeah, know yeah. <laughs> okay. ah, done. The thing is, this is more geometrical because, I mean, as I said, people were trying before with the index, and it doesn't work. But maybe it's worth maybe something. It's special about your deformation to a point. If you follow the gravitational law, there's something lined up and you're just trying to make a cone or something. No, this is not. I think this is. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, I'm just trying to see yeah, physically if it's possible. No, no, I'm just trying to see, if, is it possible? The first thing, is it possible to do it? Okay. And then I thought, well, how about think for, for curves? And if you think physically like this, I looked at some, some uh, you know, if you Google it, and, and you see this gravitation. Well, and I talked to this physicist. And you can minimize energy, or you can minimize elasticity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, it's, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Okay. That's so, what I was trying to get at. Oh, OK. Oh, no, there is a way. I just need to, uh, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so this is another problem. So, um, oh, so for your two types of Fs in your theorems, do you have a deformation in mind? The your theorem one and theorem two. With the oh, just one. take I just take F and put epsilon here. Epsilon equal that's to it. that's it. Oh. Epsilon equal to zero. Give you a point, epsilon positive, neg positive will give me my surface, negative is empty. So, so I have a birth of a surface. Yeah. you know that you have to produce different kinds of those points besides lemons in order for this to have any proportion? Because yeah, there are these, yeah, and here I get some different types. From theorem two, we get some different, yeah, different types. Yeah. Okay. 
But what I'm hoping in this deformation, you can always, I'm hoping when you deform it, you get to some nice generic more singularity with different, with the lambda difference. Maybe, maybe, I think maybe there is not just two on Felix, maybe there are four in gener some genericity thing. Maybe, I don't know. But no, I, I can tell you a story of the, but the, the theorem is true. Do I have to finish exactly at five or can I take one more minute? <coughs> All right, okay, I got your answer. Don't say anything. <laughs> so, when you, usually when people ask if they can have another minute, they go on for 15. No, 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 I never do that. No, no, no. <laughs> so, Minkowski. Okay. You still got eight minutes. All right, All right. okay. Minkowski space. What is Minkowski space? Here is R3. But now I take a pseudo-scalar product where you, now you know what u and v is u1, u2, u1, v1 plus u2, v2 minus u3, v3. So I, you put a minus here. So when it's in R4, yeah. this is space-time. Yes, it's space-time. Yeah, we still keep the space-time. <coughs> So this cone here, if you take any vector in this cone, you get a non-zero vector with a zero length. Yeah? You can get a vector on this cone. Any vector here, this is light cone. It's a light cone. And any vector inside here, will be time-like, it will have negative length, and here it will be space-like. <coughs> okay? And quickly, quickly, before David throws me out of this building <laughs> that has an open door, a <laughs> big <laughs> window. <laughs> so quickly, what is... <coughs> I have three types of planes, at least linear planes. So I can have a plane going through the origin and cutting the cone in two. This is called the time-like plane. And I have <coughs> a plane tangent to the cone. Tangent to the cone, this is light-like. And this is space-like, space-like plane. <clears throat> the problem here, if you have a plane, you have the usual normal to your plane. The normal here, or the pseudo-normal, is space-like. Here it's time-like, but here it's light-like. Here the normal sits on the plane. You don't have a normal here. Okay? Here the normal u, normal has length zero. Okay? Now you can you see what I'm getting at. Now if I have a surface in the Minkowski space, in Minkowski space, closed and convex, and closed convex in R3, one, I'll just draw it. Then there are two curves there are two curves, at least two curves, well, two curves, where the tangent is light light. Where the tangent plane is light like at each point on the curve. What does that mean? It means that the normal is not transverse. It sits inside. It has length zero. It has like zero. I cannot differentiate the normal. The unit normal, you remember the unit normal is phi u, phi v over phi u, phi v. <coughs> so I have well-defined shape operator on the Riemannian side and the uh, Lorentzian side, but not, <coughs> not on the light, or not where the, on these two curves. These two curves, what I call the light, 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 
the locus of degeneracy of the metric. Okay? So you cannot define umbilic points via the shape operator. So D N does not exist. Well, N exists as <laughs> DN is not well defined. on the LD. So I cannot define the umbilic on the LD, uh, points using this, but I have the equation of the lines of curvature, which I can define, and I can extend that umbilic points. <coughs> As you get older, you don't like to rush. <laughs> so equation of lines of principal curvature, what is the equation? If you remember, it's E pa, 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 EN minus MG. I'll just write the coefficients. Yeah, all right. DV squared plus EN minus LG, DU DV plus EM minus LF. D u squared. How did we define L, L, M, and N? We defined them as phi u u times the normal divided by its length. But you can see this equation will be, I can factor out the determinant, the, the, this. Okay? I can factor out this. So if I, did, if I call L bar is equal to phi u u, phi u star phi v, then I have a new equation here, which is equal to my equation away from the locus of degeneracy of the metric, but is well defined of the local degeneracy. So I can extend the lines of curvature, the lines of curvature through here, and I'll say that the point is light like umbilic points if these are zero. Okay? So can define, can define light like umbilic points. And the theorem, of course, now. Yeah, well, yeah, the two, two, yeah, it's something. The, 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 uh, the minors are zero, yes. That's exactly it, yeah. So the theorem is, in this case, then the, the conjecture is true. Any close, any smooth close, smooth up to smooth close and convex surface in R3, in R3-1 has at least <coughs> two umbilic points. And the way you prove this is simple. First, you look at this. You have two curves where the metric is degenerate. If this curve is singular, then this point is an umbilic point. So if they have lots of two singularity, then it's umbilic. So you're done. If it's not singular, then it's regular. Because of convexity, one of the principal directions is always transverse. While it bounds a disk, then you use Poincaré-Hoff. It has at least one. And I have the same here. So you have two. Convex. Exactly, because it's exactly it's the same. The convexity doesn't depend on uh, on the metric. Okay. Yeah. So it's yeah. So this is how. Uh, so oh, I'm finished. Uh, if it's strictly convex, then there are exactly two, and they are on this Riemannian part. So that's uh, so the thing. So you don't uh, basically that's that's the result and. 
if you let me just one minute, yeah? Or just something, some weird things that I have been observing, <coughs> which has nothing to do, well, it has a bit to do with this. So basically my talk stop, will I stop here? So I was like, you know, about the character conjecture, but I will tell you just about surfaces in R3 and R3, one. <coughs> so if you look at the, the equation of lines of curvature, you have delta has more singularity, yeah? But Morse, we have two types of Morse, A1 plus and A1 minus, discriminant of the same. It happens that here you have an A1 plus and here you have an A1 minus. So here you get these are the lines of curvature and here these are the lines of curvature. Okay. So it's, it looks like you, the, this is one case where you have two possibilities. One has to be in the Euclidean and the other has to be in the Minkowski. Another thing is about curves. <coughs> if I take curves in R2, and in R2, Minkowski, and I look at their parallels. If, parallels, oh, yeah. parallels, yeah. The parallels, if you have, uh, if, if you take parallel, then it has to be like this. If you have vertex here, then the parallels are like this. So well, how do you get these parallels? Is basically you take a swallow tail, you take its sections, and you project them. And there are two types of projections of the swallow tails. It's one like that, or, or like this. You have two types of parallels of taking sections of the of a swallow tail and then projecting them. You have two possible types. One of them have in the Euclidean. In fact, if you look at all books, when you see a parallels, they always draw them like this. But in fact, you can draw them either like this or like this. But in fact, for Euclidean, you have no choice. The Euclidean case are like this, and the Minkowski are like it. So it seems to me that there is something to understand that when you have possibilities, general possibilities, some, and some of them happened in the, the metric basically distinguish which one occurs in one context and which in the other. And they are complementary in some sense. I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.